I find a really interesting example of that in marketing and copywriting. So would you agree that Claude Hopkins was pretty decent? Oh yeah, he's, I've read that book, My Life in Advertising, even more than Scientific Advertising, but both of them. So if you look at Claude Hopkins, Ogilvy, the rest of the people, but new marketers will come in and go, oh, but that's old. But if you look at the copy today, and how many things, and if you can see a repeat, that's like an ad. If you see an ad running over and over, they're not just wasting money, it converts. And so it's real interesting when you have people, especially new marketing people that come in and go, oh no, 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 I would never read that stuff. It's old. So I'm glad you brought that up. You want to be the exception to the market, but you don't want to try to make your market the exception. You want to be the exception to your market, but you don't want to try to make your market the exception. So I personally want to study from the old greats. I personally want to find the edges and advantages that nobody else is willing to find. But I can't expect my, my customers to do the same. If I do, I'm going to be upset and so are they. So we want to play the odds. And the odds say, I don't want you to change. I know your tendency is to seek out the new. So I am going to give you the best version of the new the safest, most effective version of the new, the most legitimate version of the new. And I hope some of you, I will be able to transition into a fundamental business. I wanna give you an advantage so you can make money because money is the oxygen of business. But then I also am gonna be along for the ride and say, maybe you might wanna consider putting some structure around this, right? Maybe you might wanna consider putting some legs underneath this. And half of my success stories are only temporary. Half of your success stories are probably only temporary. Most people who build a successful business can't keep it. So the, the idea that most businesses die of indigestion versus starvation. So these businesses starve to death and then the other ones, they bite off more than they can chew. And then they choke to death. It's a miracle any of us can ever actually build a business. That's why if you have a successful business, you should pray to your God of choice or every God say, how that happened? Because it's a near impossibility. So let's go back to Milton H. Erickson, MD from Phoenix, Arizona, right? Who studies him religiously like I did? Who, who thinks for six months on the saying of I witnessed my sister offer an apple and hold it back, right? You know, he's tone deaf. His only color that he can enjoy is purple. He, he can't see purple. He can enjoy purple. Why did he say enjoy purple versus see purple? He's colorblind. Purple is the only color I can enjoy as he wears this big purple freaking thing. You wear purple everything, right? I'm studying that stuff. If I want you to be successful in persuasion and expect you to go to the same length that I have gone, we're both going to be disappointed. I am giving you the best version of that, the Cliff Notes version of that. Knowing full well, you'll, it is unlikely you'll ever be able to do it as well as I can do it. Because I got a thousand hours of head start on you, and I'm probably more predisposed to be naturally gifted at it than you are. Just because it's already drawn me to it. So the goal isn't to get as good at it as I am. The goal is to get 20% of the input to get 80% of the results of what I got. And that's why you pay me money. So you can get the 80%. Now you're in a better position than I'm in. Cause I'm thinking, man, all this stuff that I know, I'm way down on the list of companies in terms of annual revenue. I was reading an article this morning. Adobe just bought and acquired Figma. Was it 70? I thought it was 20 billion. Was it 70? It was probably 70. It's, it's billions. What I remembered seeing from the article was something along the lines of they paid 20 times what the revenue of Figma was worth. So it's 20 billion, right? Okay, yeah. So they, they, they acquired Figma for $20 billion, which was several times the top line revenue of the business. Essentially, I did the math, and I think the, the top line revenue of the business was like 200 million a year. And of that 200 million with the operating costs and all the overhead and everything, they're probably net profiting less than our company net profited last year. The only difference is, is because they can be scalable and because they're a threat to an existing Titan, they get 20 billion and I couldn't sell my business for a fraction of that, you know? Zoom, the year that they, went, they IPO'd, one of the reasons they IPO'd at like $30 billion was because they turned a profit the year before. The profit their company turned the year before was less than the personal take-home profit I put in my pocket that year. They can't send mobile-friendly emails. That's one of the things I told them when we got started. They're sending webinar reminder emails for the webinar they're promoting of mine and they're broken on mobile. I'm like, you guys need to fix that. And they're laughing at me. Why? Because we're worth $30 billion. Obviously, they're focusing on things that I'm not focusing on. Companies like that where they're really good is they're able to take the good enough versions of 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 strategic applications. 
Guys like me, I want to get really good at one thing. As a kid, I always said to myself, man, one day I want to be the best in the world at something. It was just something I wanted to do. And then I became the best in the world at webinars. But the cost of that was not being good at many, 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 many other things. And I'm okay with that, okay? Because whether if my company gets acquired for $20 billion, I'm still going to wear clothes that don't fit me tomorrow probably, right? The money is great. It's the pursuit of the strategy that I like. The money helps me see how good I am because I can say, well, for what I do compared to who everybody else is, I don't know anybody that can go toe to toe with me. So that makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm good from that perspective, but it's limiting from a business perspective. So the long convoluted answer to your question is, I don't want, nor should I ever expect my customers to be the exception in mass. I don't want them to study the models that I study and the trends that I study. I don't want them to have to know what various different markets are doing. Even though I know nothing specifically really about YouTube from the perspective of what you guys know about YouTube, I do understand the lay of the land of YouTube. I do know what the popular videos are on YouTube. I, know, I do know what the trends are on YouTube. I do understand the algorithm and how it works because I have to because my clients use YouTube. I have to because the eyeballs are on YouTube. I have to because the public at large is now on YouTube. That's where they hang out. So I study all of these markets and I do all of these other things, but I don't want my customers to do that. I want my customers to come in, not know what crypto is, take advantage of an inefficiency in the market that everybody else is overlooking, spend this amount of time, and then go about their day. I want people to get on TikTok and not get obsessed with it. I don't want them to get a dopamine addiction to the program. I hate social media from that perspective. Is this designed to be addictive? It is worse than a casino, but, this is why I'm on it now, because I'm like, I'm not gonna change it if I sit on the outside yelling at clouds, right? I gotta get in the middle of it and do something about it. But I'm, I'm intimately aware of the makings and the mechanisms of all these things, but I want my clients to get the best of them and then have a life. So that's the role and the belief that I have. So how can I help my clients with the least amount of effort get the most amount of results? So I don't expect them to study the Claude Hopkins. I don't expect them to learn the intricacies. I expect 1% of them to which is great. So they can come into rooms like this and we can hang out and I can work with their businesses and maybe we can do deals and maybe we can publish some of them and maybe we can promote some of them and all that kind of stuff. But I, I wanna be the exception for my market so they don't have to be. I wanna be the advocate. So I look at my audience as an advocate. So I say, okay, my audience is gonna to wanna to do TikTok. Uh, too bad, but they are, right? I gotta, if that's what they want, I gotta get them there in style. I gotta take the greatest care to give them the best advantage because that's what they wanna do. So how can I do that? Can I do that? Most of, nine times out of 10, I can't do that. But one time out of 10, oh, I can do that. Now the very specific, the narrowest path that we're taking, this is a lesson too. Hopefully it's not too complicated. When I talked earlier about clearly defined outcomes, whenever I go into a webinar, the exceptions are my webinars that fail. I forget to do this sometimes or think I'm better than this sometimes, right? Like sometimes I pretend that I can defy the law of gravity. But, but when I come into clearly defined outcomes, my outcome of every single webinar, every single webinar that I write is by the time I'm done, whatever subject matter I'm approaching or talking about, I want you to conclude that on that very specific topic, there's nobody that has more insight than Jason Flatland. Nobody. The best way to do that is to pick the narrowest topic possible. So I, I did a product with a, a gentleman named Ed Viesters, and Ed Viesters is was the first American to climb the 14 highest summits in the world that are over 8,000 meters without supplemental oxygen. First American, you couldn't beat him. So I had the very best. So I knew that I had something in that market, but listen to how it was carved up. Without supplemental oxygen, American, 14 highest peaks over 8,000. So people climb in Everest, right? Pretty soon it became, there was the first person to ever climb Everest. Uh, then there was the first person from you know, Indonesia to ever climb Everest. And then there was the first person under 18 to climb Everest. They just started carving the market up even smaller and smaller and smaller, but there was always a first. I want to be the first. And if I have to carve the market up small enough to be the first or to be the best, then that's what I'll be. So our clearly defined outcome for the TikTok thing is promoting high ticket affiliate products, affiliate products that do product launches. That's our target. Now we can't come out and say to the audience, this is what you're gonna do, I wish it was that easy. Just like you can't see somebody that you wanna date and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna marry you right away, right? You just gotta be like, all right, hold on, you gotta say hi first. 
You gotta warm up the situation. We only frame things in a way that the audience could understand it. And so not just any affiliate products, they have to be high ticket. Not just any high ticket affiliate products. They have to be ones that get launched. And there's a whole reason and whole logic for it. But ultimately at the end of the day, not only is Seth the best at doing this right now, he can be positioned and understood by the audience in 45 minutes or less as being the very best at it. That's what's important. And that's what the whole webinar essentially does. It gets people invested in this idea. Now this seems simple, but it's not. What are all the potential objections that I'm gonna face selling this product? The big ones. Yeah, do I have to run ads? Which is actually really easy. With TikTok, we're just like, uh, no, you don't have to run ads. This is all organic. So that was an easy one. So that's not an objection I'm too concerned about, although we do handle it. So I'm glad you brought that up. What's that? I don't, well, yeah, that's why you have an affiliate thing, right? So you don't have to have one. Do I have to put my face on videos? Yeah, that's, that's an objection, but it's not a really big one. The biggest objection you would normally face in this is our procedural objections. I'm telling you to do X and you say, I can't do X. So, you know, launch an Amazon business. That's a lot, right? Even create a YouTube video is a lot for most people. The beauty of TikTok is it's 60 seconds. I don't even have the product objection. I can't make a TikTok video. That's easy for them to believe, especially because Seth teaches them to record it one line at a time, which is fantastic. So I don't have the normal product objection. Well, I can't do X. I can't set up a website. I can't build a funnel. I can't blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm thinking yet, because you've done things a million times more complicated than that, and none of them made you rich. So why wouldn't you do this thing? The objections are really unobvious. Let me give them to you. This is an objection. 90% of my audience still don't really understand truly what affiliate marketing is. You would think internet marketers who follow me, the company that has the greatest track record as an affiliate marketer in the entire history of internet marketing, who teaches them affiliate marketing, who has a program called Affiliate Triad that we have marketed and launched throughout the years, who promotes affiliate offers all the time. You think my audience would know what this is or the affiliates audience that we're getting or the general public. But just like Amazon sellers don't know what private label is, internet marketers don't know what affiliate marketing is. And if they kind of know what it is, they're prejudiced towards their own limited belief of what affiliate marketing is. They think it's like selling low ticket stuff, which is another issue, right? So there are two big objections with this one. The first one is it's not what they're used to from the affiliate side. Their model of reality says affiliate stuff that I see being promoted all over the place are like these little makeup stuff, these makeup brushes, these cheap things. These, you know, it's like almost like Mary Kay style or, or Avon style. The other objection with high ticket is what for most people in my market or in general? It's a big one. Yeah, it's a money objection. It's not a money that they're gonna, it's like people will feel very uncomfortable asking you to spend $2,000. Everybody almost is very uncomfortable asking somebody else to spend a lot of money. And even if they're not doing the one asking, if they're the ones promoting somebody else who's doing the asking, vicariously, it's like they're asking. So I have to somehow teach them in a way that, that even the dumbest person on the webinar can understand what this is, and that this isn't a big deal. And then this thing too. It was a product launch. See, the, by the way, this is a lot of times I break the fourth wall when you read my emails. I want to teach them to be smarts, not marks. In the wrestling, pro wrestling business, there were marks who believed it was real, and then there were the smarts who understood that it was a work, it was an angle, right? I'm trying to teach them to be smarts, so then when I sell them things, they are more intelligent on how to buy them. So that's one of the reasons why it's really important that you break down industries and how they work. So I got to explain to them why a product launch, why can't I just pick any high ticket product? And there's an even one more wrinkle to this, they have to be proven to convert. So then how do you prove that? This is why this whole deal to position, it takes 45 minutes just to do this. It has nothing to do with TikTok really. Then I have to show them within the confinements of TikTok how we make this happen and why it's so effective. Here's what we don't have to convince them, that TikTok is the hottest thing since sliced bread. They get that. We don't have to convince them that they should be on TikTok because they're already sitting there saying, man, I'm not on TikTok and I need to be. And a lot of them are on TikTok. My daughter's principal, not the high school daughter, but the other daughter, uh, she's on TikTok. And every single day I drop my daughter off, she's out there dancing like a lunatic. I'm like, oh, she's one of those TikTok people that are dancing all the time on TikTok, you know? But my daughter has a TikTok. My 12-year-old daughter has a TikTok. 
Uh, now there's rules that we had to set up for her, but she shot two, she's created 200 TikTok videos plus. I've done some cool in my life. There's no doubt about it. None of it impresses him. Hiring Manny to start doing social media in his company. Most impressive thing I've ever done in my daughter's eyes. Cause now I'm on TikTok. I don't get stats from Manny. I get stats from Lainey, my daughter, right? Daddy, this is how many followers you have now. This is how many things you have now. This is what you do it now, right? And she's like, I won't, she's like, you need to tag me in your videos. You know, I'm like oh. everybody's like that. So I don't have to sell that. That's what everybody else would sell. They start the conversation there. I start the conversation in, you know, in football, I don't want to start at my 20 yard line. I want to start at your one yard line. That's what I want to do. So I started, I started there. I don't have to sell the concept. I just have to sell this, which maybe we can do it. Maybe we can't. So I want you to go and revisit your market and say, where am I assuming things that maybe I should not necessarily assume? What is the real thing that I can position myself in? So at the end of it, they say, there is nobody who can help me better than you when it comes to blank.